Hey guys, turkey normally steals the spotlight at Thanksgiving, but we can probably all admit that there's a side dish or two with a special place in our hearts. Mashed potatoes, yams, green bean casserole. This week we're taking all these normally supporting players and giving them the starring roles they deserve. Let's get down to basics. All right guys, so let's start with mashed potatoes. Traditionally, the script reads for us to mash them with a potato masher and mix them with butter. But we're gonna flip the potato script, and I'm sorry this is the last time I'll say that, by sous viding the potatoes in their own private butter bath. Don't you wish that you could say the same about yourself? So into a vacuum sealed bag goes three large russet potatoes, one and a half sticks of butter, salt, white pepper, and one entire cup of heavy cream. This is Thanksgiving, folks. It's the one time it's socially acceptable to eat like this. So being very careful, we are vacuum sealing all these fats and starches together into one beautiful mass and dropping into a 194 degree Fahrenheit sous vide, the temperature of which you might need to maintain using a clean kitchen towel as a sort of sous vide swaddling cloth. Then 30 to 40 minutes later, we are now removing our very tender potatoes, which we should be able to crush effortlessly using our gloved fingers and pouring through a fine mesh sieve. Might have to crush these up a little bit into manageable pieces before pressing them through, creating a potato mash that is very fine indeed that we want to whisk minimally Minimally, just enough to incorporate the butter because we don't want to build up any gluten. Into a serving bowl they go, smoothed out, and served with the headline that mashed potatoes will never be the same. Because from this day forth, they shall be known as palm puree. But what about yams? You know, that part of your Thanksgiving dinner that's actually dessert? Well, while we are going to prepare these a little bit more traditionally with one and a half sticks of butter, half a cup of brown sugar, half a cup of raw or demurra sugar, and a solid tablespoon of cinnamon, and maybe a teaspoon and a half of freshly grated nutmeg, we are going to dress it up in some new and exciting ways. Into a generously buttered casserole go three peeled and sliced yams, a generous pinch of kosher salt, and our sugar butter mixture. It would probably be easier to mix this up in a bowl beforehand, but it's Thanksgiving. We're trying to cut down on dishes, right? So once we've given that little mix, we're covering and baking at 375 degrees Fahrenheit for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to give them a good mix and return them to the oven uncovered for another 15 to 20 minutes, during which time I'm going to pour some boiling whiskey over some craisins and let them soak until the sweet potatoes emerge from the oven, at which point we're going to top them with some ricotta cheese, a healthy serving of our whiskey-soaked craisins, and some toasted pecans. And if you want to go really crazy, how about a nice healthy drizzle of honey? Now take a look at that and tell me that you'd rather have the stuff with marshmallows on it. I mean, I would totally eat the stuff with marshmallows on it, but variety is the spice of Thanksgiving. All right, now that I've officially gone off the rails, let's make some green bean casserole. We're going to start by making homemade French fried onions by cutting two large onions in half, slicing them thinly in a mandolin, and dousing them in about a cup of buttermilk. We're going to let those soak for about 15 minutes before draining and coating in all-purpose flour. Once those are evenly coated and the excess flour has been shaken off via sieve, we're bringing these bad boys over to a relatively tepid bath of 300 degree Fahrenheit vegetable oil. These onions have a lot of moisture in them and they're going to cook very quickly, so a lower temperature deep fry is preferable. We're letting these go for about seven to nine minutes until they are gorgeously golden brown, crisp, and a hell of a lot better than anything you're ever gonna get out of a can. We're going to lightly season them with kosher salt and try not to eat all of them before they end up on our casserole, but admittedly, this is a challenge. Next up, we gotta make some gourmet cream of mushroom soup. We're starting by stemming, crushing, and finely chopping eight ounces of cremini mushrooms. Once we've got everybody stemmed, squashed, and sliced, we're bringing the whole party over to an awaiting high-walled saute pan with about three tablespoons of butter, a bubble in. We're then gonna saute the whole affair together with a generous pinch of salt that's gonna help draw the moisture out of the mushrooms. Once all this moisture has evaporated, we're going to add one heaping tablespoon of flour. We're gonna saute this together with the mushrooms and the butter, forming a rudimentary roux for about one minute before adding two cloves of crushed garlic, sauteing for another 30 seconds, and then deglazing with a little bit of cognac, flambéing if desired. Oh my god, make sure you take out the wooden spoon. Wooden spoon in the pot. Get it out of there. Little known fact, wood is flammable. We're then going to add about a cup and a half of chicken stock and one cup of heavy cream. Mixing together, bringing to a simmer, adding a little dash of soy sauce, a trick courtesy of J. Kenji Lopez Alt, and simmering until dark, thick, rich, and the best cream of mushroom soup you've ever had. Then we're going to prep our green beans by cutting off the stems and slicing into one inch pieces, which we are going to parboil for about two minutes until bright green and then shock in an ice bath. These are going to be baked, but not long enough to cook them through. So once we've drained them, we're mixing them together with our cream of mushroom soup and maybe half of our French fried onions. I wish you could smell this, but well, YouTube technology is just not there yet. Once combined, we're pouring into a generously buttered casserole, covering and baking at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 
15 to 20 minutes or until bubbly. We shall then uncover, sprinkle on the remainder of our french fried onions, and cook for another 5 to 10 minutes or until browned and bubbly. You know, the two greatest words in the English language. Now for this one, I don't have the patience to do a traditional tracking shot, I gotta dig in right now. This is one of those few things in life that it's absolutely worth it to burn your mouth on. This is my absolute favorite Thanksgiving side, it's also my dad's favorite, he just got out of surgery, and I'm super excited to go home and make it for him and all the other people that I love. Because that's what Thanksgiving sides are really all about love for your dad for yourself or for your camera crew so from me and mine to you and yours happy holidays i will see you next week when i'll be making turkey and pumpkin pie from a charlie brown thanksgiving and buttered toast and popcorn and pretzels and jelly beans and ice cream sundaes i guess Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we are taking a look at Snoopy's Thanksgiving dinner, which I don't think is that bad, as long as you eat around the black licorice jelly beans. I'm kind of a pink man myself. Just kidding, of course, we are making pumpkin pie and Snoopy's whole roast turkey. If your whole fresh turkey has one of those pop out when it's done things, take that out. We don't need that where we're going. And our first of many steps is to loosen the skin from the body of the turkey, which we're going to do by shoving our begloved digits between the meat and the skin until it resembles the skin around your elbows. Ugh. Sorry. That's gross, it's just the most accurate comparison I've got. Next up, we're combining about a quarter cup of kosher salt with maybe a tablespoon of freshly ground black pepper. We are seasoning the cavity and the meat underneath the skin. Then once all the meat is nice and seasoned and we've used up about three quarters of the mixture, we're going to add about a teaspoon and a half of baking powder to make a seasoning for the skin itself. This is going to lower the temperature at which the Maillard reaction occurs and gives us a more brown skin. So once we've got every inch of this bird deeply seasoned and baking and powdered, we're going to let it rest uncovered in the fridge for 24 hours, which I dare say is plenty of time to get to work on our pumpkin pie. For this, we are going to need one sugar pie pumpkin. I'm using two because I need extra puree because I'm making pumpkin pie for my family for Thanksgiving, but if you're just making one pie, you just need one pumpkin sliced in half and removed of its seeds and guts. Then we're placing these cut side down on a parchment lined baking sheet and roasting at 325 degrees Fahrenheit for one hour, which I dare say is plenty of time to make our pie crust. Into the bowl of a food processor goes six and one quarter ounces of all-purpose flour, 10 tablespoons of very cold, chilled, unsalted butter that we're gonna pulse together until it resembles something between tiny pebbles and wet sand. We want little tiny chunks of butter that can be just barely distinguished by the human eye. We're then pouring this mixture into a medium bowl, adding the half teaspoon of salt and one tablespoon of sugar that we should have added in the food processor, mixing those together, and then sprinkling some ice water over top. I'm starting with three and a half tablespoons that gives me about a half a tablespoon of leeway if the dough is too dry. So we're gently folding that together, trying to mix as little as possible. Turning out onto our work surface, we're just trying to make sure that all of the flour is hydrated. Once it forms a cohesive mass, we are wrapping in plastic wrap and refrigerating for at least 30 minutes, which I dare say is plenty of time to make our pie filling. I'm sorry, I promise that's the last time I'll say that. Our pumpkins are out of the oven, and we know that they're done because a paring knife can pass through them without resistance. So we want to peel the skins off these pumpkins and allow them to let off a little steam, like a coworker at an open bar Christmas party. But while it's still warm, I want to put about two cups into the bowl of a food processor. This is going to help it combine more easily with one cup of packed brown sugar, and optionally a tablespoon or two of maple syrup. We are processing that together for 60 to 90 seconds until very smooth, and then we're going to start adding some spices. I'm going with two teaspoons of cinnamon, two teaspoons of ground ginger, a quarter teaspoon each of allspice and ground cloves, and a generous grating of freshly grated nutmeg. This is the one that makes all the difference, trust me. Plus we're adding a half a cup of milk and three quarters of cup of heavy cream. And now that we've got some nice cold stuff in there, we can add our eggs without cooking them. Four eggs in total, and then we are processing everyone together for an additional minute until smooth and creamy. Then get that out of the way because it's time to lightly flour our work surface, hands, and rolling pin, and prepare our freshly refrigerated dough for its enwidening. Yes, I know that is very far from an actual word. Regardless, we are rolling this guy out to about two inches wider than our pie pan. Then we're going to use our rolling pin to roll the dough up, and then unfurl into said awaiting pie pan, and you might notice that mine looks pretty bad. And at this point, you need to make a decision. What's more important to you, light, flaky, crispy layers, or perfectly fluted pastry? If your answer is the former, then patch it up as best you can and refrigerate for 15 minutes. Trust me, it's gonna end up looking just fine. Poke a whole bunch of holes in the bottom with a fork, press down a layer of aluminum foil into the bottom of the pie crust, and fill with your desired pie weight. I'm going with 
brown rice. Then we are par-baking this crust for 15 minutes at 400 degrees Fahrenheit on a preheated pizza stone. This is going to help accelerate the browning and prevent soggy bottoms. Then into our hot pie shell goes the pie filling. We're giving the whole thing a little tappy tap to get rid of any stubborn bubbles and baking for about 25 minutes until the crust is brown and the filling is set but jiggly. Just a little jiggle like that. Then we are refrigerating overnight. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go get some sleep. You can tell it's the next day because my shirt is ever so slightly different and we are cutting up some bread for our stuffing because today is turkey day. And into a 225 degree Fahrenheit oven goes about three quarters of a loaf of white sandwich bread cut into one half inch pieces, tossed occasionally and baked for one hour until completely dry. Then here we have the base elements of stuffing. Don't worry, I'll go over this on the stovetop. Into a high walled saute pan goes about three tablespoons of unsalted butter that we're gonna get all nice and melty and foamy before adding one medium finely chopped Spanish onion. Onion. We're just going to saute this for a few minutes or until soft and translucent. Then we're going to add two ribs of finely chopped celery very slowly for dramatic effect, I guess. Saute for an additional minute just to introduce some heat to the celery. And then we're going to start adding some chopped herbs, one tablespoon of freshly chopped sage and one teaspoon each chopped thyme and rosemary, all of which we're going to saute for another two to three minutes to let those flavors, I don't know, get to know each other. Then we've got our cooled off bread cubes in a large bowl to which we're going to add about a tablespoon of finely chopped parsley and our onion celery herb mixture, along with about two-thirds of a cup of fresh turkey stock. If you want to see how to make turkey stock, go check out the Moist Maker Sandwich video in the upper right-hand corner right now. We're tossing everything together, seasoning with kosher salt and freshly ground pepper to taste, and we want to reach this consistency where everything is sticking together, but there are still individual cubes of bread. That's looking perfect, so here comes our air-chilled turkey, the inside of which we are going to line with a couple layers of cheesecloth. I know that sounds weird, but this is going to make it really easy to get all the stuffing out of the bird, which we're going to want to do because by the time the stuffing is properly cooked, the bird will be overcooked. So we're shoving as much stuffing as will fit in our bird's ass, I don't know what you call it, cavity, they both sound gross. Tying the cheesecloth shut behind it and then tying the legs over top using a piece of butcher's twine. Then it's time to set this guy up on a roasting rack, but what if you don't have one? Not to worry, like most problems in life, this can be solved with aluminum foil. We're just going to roll up some cylinders of aluminum foil and line the bottom of the pan just enough to elevate the turkey off the bottom of the pan. We are placing the breast side down for the first half of cooking and lining the bottom with bacon. I'm going to add a sort of cross strut here for additional turkey support. And into a preheated 325 degree Fahrenheit oven she goes for two to two and a half hours until the thickest part of the breast registers 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Just enough time to prepare for phase two of cooking, which involves the deployment of root vegetables, which it looks like Snoopy used to serve the turkey on. So we're placing these turnips, parsnips, carrots, and pearl red onions into a bowl, seasoning with kosher salt and freshly ground pepper, giving them a drizzle of vegetable oil, and seeing if we can toss them in a bowl that's too small for the job. Here we go. One. Uh, oh, all right, we lost a couple. All right. One. Two. Okay, we lost a carrot, no biggie. Eventually you get these evenly coated and the turkey will emerge from its slumber once it's reached 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And look at that, bacon curved into a perfect smile for your congee breakfast bowl from Mulan. Once we have removed our bacon blanket, it's time to make a new bed for our beast. Into a rimmed baking sheet go our root vegetables topped with a wire rack. And on top of that goes our turkey, this time breast side up, because it's time to both quickly roast our vegetables and brown this sucker. First, we have to remove our stuffing from the situation, so cut open and legs and really disgustingly retrieve our poultry parcel, which we're going to set aside because now it's time to give our bird a butter bath. In clarified butter to be precise, clarified butter doesn't burn at the same temperature as regular butter. It's easy to make and it's going to give us a really deeply brown skin. So once you've brushed every square inch of this guy, it's going into an increased 425 degree Fahrenheit oven for about 45 minutes, during which time we can finish preparing our stuffing. We're going to combine the cavity stuffing, ew, which we're going to combine with the rest of the refrigerated stuffing, which should cool it down enough to add one egg beaten into a quarter cup of turkey stock. This is just going to help bind everything together and get everybody to the right final consistency. We're just giving that a cursory mix before dumping into a generously buttered casserole in which we're going to spread the stuffing evenly, cover and set aside until the turkey comes out the oven. Here's the time that you can finalize any cranberry sauce or gravies because once that turkey hits 160 degrees in the thickest part of the breast, it is time to take it out and admire its shatteringly crisp skin. We're taking our turkey tom off the rack so we can retrieve any accumulated juices in the pan 
for gravy enhancement. We are then letting our turkey rest for 30 minutes at room temperature uncovered. I know I've said to cover turkeys in the past with aluminum foil. Do not do it or you're going to ruin this beautifully crisp skin. We're then giving our vegetables a little toss and returning them to the oven along with the stuffing for about 20 minutes until both are fully cooked. Last up, I need to make whipped cream for the pumpkin pie. I can't find my hand mixer, so I'm left with only one choice, which is to mix by hand. Today was buys and tries day at the gym, so needless to say, this was a challenge. I can really only recommend it in the most desperate of circumstances like these. Once you've got some nice stiff peaks going, it's time to plate up. After a short break, of course. Oh my god, I have never felt more my age. A little taste to make sure that we've added enough sugar. You can add vanilla if you like. And then onto a large serving platter go our roast root vegetables, on top of which, just for that sort of Norman Rockwell effect, we're going to place our whole turkey. I can't really recommend this, it's way more difficult to carve, but I get it, it's traditional, and we're serving that up with our gravy, stuffing, cranberry sauce, and pumpkin pie. I know Snoopy didn't serve all this stuff, but what the hell is turkey without gravy? We're topping our pie with a healthy layer of whipped cream, and there you have it. I gotta say, it looks a hell of a lot better than jelly beans, toast, and pretzel sticks. And while a whole turkey certainly looks good, it's very hard to carve at the table, so I would enthusiastically recommend carving it beforehand. First we gotta take off the drumsticks and then we gotta remove the wishbone, not only because it's going to make it easier to remove the breasts, but because we get to make a wish. Whoever gets the longer side gets to, oh, if, if it breaks in the middle, what happens? Some kind of wish stalemate. Anyway, we are cutting down the side of the breastbone and then cutting underneath the breast to remove it for easy slicing. Try to keep the skin as intact as possible, it's gonna make for a better presentation. Slice to your desired specifications, plate up, and then dark meat is where it gets kinda tricky. I kinda like to just remove the whole thigh and shred the meat. And there you have it, way easier to carve up beforehand, and I think that makes just as handsome a presentation. And legally, after having turkey, you have to have some pumpkin pie. If you are allergic to or afraid of pumpkins, apple is an acceptable substitute. Now I gotta say, this is the best pumpkin pie I've ever had. It's light and smooth and creamy, but that being said, I gotta save room. I mean, it's not even actually Thanksgiving yet. Hey guys, I just want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving and share the all-new Binging with Babish Spanish channel with you. The link is in this video's description. It's a place where you and your Spanish-speaking friends can enjoy overdubbed episodes of Binging with Babish every Wednesday. The Moistmaker episode goes live tomorrow. Check it out, have some turkey, have fun with your friends and family, and cook something for someone you care about. Instead of stuffing, I'm going to fill the turkey with a slightly smaller turkey. It's called a tur-turkey key. A tur-turkey key? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, oh, oh. Yeah, I was there for the insertion. He used shoehorns. I'll be having sides. What's up, dude? Yeah, what did you want me to do again? Oh, f that. Okay, now that we've got that out of our systems, it's time to get to making the tur tur key key, which for the record, like all of you, I think is a patently bad idea. But I think the only way we're gonna make it work is by deboning one of our turkeys. In this case, Jeffrey, our slightly smaller turkey. I'm sorry if my anthropomorphizing them earlier made this difficult to watch. But to debone the turkey, we're basically making shallow cuts, starting at the spine, going underneath the thigh and the breast, and making our way around the carcass, which we're then going to delicately separate from the the thin layer of skin between the breasts. Set that aside for stock making, and then it's time to try and even out our breast meat, which is very thick at the top and very thin at the bottom, so we're gonna place some shallow cuts right up near the top of the breast so we can spread them out a little bit more evenly. Then I'm also going to remove the wings for both ease of rolling and insertion, and then I'm gonna score the breast meat a little bit, which is going to allow us to season it a little bit more deeply. Set the wings aside, these are also great for making stock, and then it's time to season the interior of our bird with a few generous pinches of kosher salt and a few generous twists of freshly ground black pepper. It was at this point that I also decided it would probably be best to remove the thigh bones as well, which we're going to accomplish by scraping the meat down the side of the bone, separating the bone at the joint, and running our knife in between. And again, set aside to make turkey stock. We're about to destroy this perfectly good turkey, so we might as well make as much use of it as possible. And now it's time to roll and tie our turkey into a long, cylindrical, tubular shape that's going to make it easier to insert into the cavity of the other turkey. Ugh. 
cut off the strings and flip the bird over so we can also tie up the legs. Because despite everything else that's happening here, we still want our turkey to at least have a somewhat Norman Rockwell appearance. I also decided to flip it over and tie it a few more times so it didn't look so ribbed for your turkey's pleasure, but that ended up kind of making it worse. So I just decided to soldier forward, not thinking too much about the social and moral repercussions of what I was doing, and set up Jeffrey for an overnight dry brine, which is accomplished simply enough by heavily coating the outside of the bird with kosher salt, maybe a few twists of freshly ground black pepper, and refrigerating uncovered overnight, during which time we can get to the noble profession of making stock. I'm just going to lay out all of our various turkey trimming byproducts on a wire rack set in a rim baking sheet, drizzle with a little bit of vegetable oil, and hit in a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven for 30 to 45 minutes, until deeply golden brown and ready to make some delicious turkey juice. Directly into our tallest and narrowest stock pot they go. The more narrow the pot, the less evaporation there's going to be, and the longer you can let it simmer without having to top up with extra water. I'm also going to add some celery, some carrots, a whole head of garlic chopped in half, a whole onion quartered, a few sprigs each of fresh rosemary and fresh thyme, a little handful of parsley, a few whole black peppercorns, and two bay leaves. It is the perfect mathematical formula for amazing stuffing and gravy this Thanksgiving. Bring it to a bare simmer, partially cover, and let it go for anywhere from 4 to 24 hours, using an induction burner like this one if you don't want to leave the stove on all night. Meanwhile, our bird has emerged from the refrigerator, its skin desiccated and ready to be crisped in a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven. For how long, I cannot say. It depends entirely upon the size of your bird, the performance of your oven. The best thing you can do is roast until the skin is glassy crisp and the thickest part of the breast registers 155 degrees Fahrenheit. In its current form, this bird would be absolutely lovely to slice and serve, but now it's time to ruin it. First, we're going to go ahead and align it with our receiving turkey. Might as well snip the strings off. This thing should be able to hold its form all on its own. This is all starting to remind me of those videos of planes refueling mid-flight or middle school health class videos. Next, of course, we have to lubricate our insertive turkey. Oh, rope, wrong lube. Let's use some vegetable oil. Now, if you have any small children, I would ask them to leave the room because it is time to insert our turkey torpedo. This really doesn't look right. Let's 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 go ahead and blur this. Not trying to get demonetized here. I'm kidding, of course. This is perfectly natural and normal and part of life. Oh my god, here come the shoehorns. I honestly got these shoehorns as a joke and never intended to use them, but I can't seem to get this horrible thing to happen, so I need a little shoehorn help. And look at that, it actually worked. Oh god, that is horrible to look at. I totally get what Robin was talking about now. I think I've just ruined Thanksgiving. Oh, no, wait, now I've ruined it. Anyway, we're just gonna keep shoving this turkey in there until we have ourselves a tur tur key key Probably one of the worst ideas ever, not only because of the spectacle of insertion, but because it virtually guarantees that one turkey is either going to be overcooked or undercooked. Because by the time this giant receiving bird has finished cooking through, its turkey dildo will have become hilariously dry. But in the name of science, I press forward and humbly present to you the tur tur key key Now the reason that I pre-cooked the smaller turkey is because if I inserted it raw, it would have taken forever to cook and the exterior turkey would have been completely destroyed. With this cooking method, however, most of the turkey is salvageable and none of it will go to waste. I will be using it in the Thanksgiving Leftovers episode of Basics coming this Thursday. And now, of course, onto the quote-unquote good version of the tur turkey key, inspired by an old recipe from J. Kenji Lopez Alt. One that starts by not only deboning the turkey, but removing the meat and trying to keep as much of the skin intact as possible, because it is now our intention to make a turkey roulade, which will allow us to stuff our turkey with more turkey. First, we're going to start by making some sausage out of the dark meat. To do so, I'm going to trim off the gristle and fat from the meat of the thigh and drumstick, cut into one inch cubes, and place on a parchment lined baking sheet or plate to be chilled in the freezer for 15 to 25 minutes until just starting to turn firm around the edges. This is going to make the meat a whole lot easier to grind, which I'm going to do in a food processor whose blade I have also chilled in the freezer. Into the food processor goes the dark meat, which we are going to pulse repeatedly until we get a nice, finely textured dark meat ground turkey, which we're going to dump out into a bowl and begin adding some flavor to. That sentence didn't turn out right. Anyway, I'm going to add some finely chopped fresh herbs, a little bit of sage, probably a packed tablespoon's worth, maybe a half teaspoon of finely minced thyme, and a teaspoon of finely minced rosemary. I am also, of course, going to season liberally with kosher salt and freshly ground pepper. And because I'm trying to evoke as many Thanksgiving flavors as possible, a little bit of freshly grated nutmeg, and a clove or two of freshly grated garlic. After all, tis the season to be, well, seasoned. Mix that all together until the herbs and spices are evenly distributed 
grated and voila, some delicious turkey sausage, which we are now going to stuff into our breast. First, we have to remove the tender from the bottom of the breast, along with trimming off any fat or gristle that might be hanging out. And then we're gonna butterfly this bad boy because we want it nice and thin for our roulade. It's still pretty uneven, so I'm gonna cover it with plastic wrap and pound it flat with either a meat mallet or a frying pan. And then I want it to resemble more of a rectangle, so I'm going to trim and butterfly the tender and use it to sort of patch the corner of the breast, turning it into kind of a rectangle. Then we're going to evenly spread our sausage mixture over top, pat it down, and commence to rolling it up, making sure to start rolling with the side that's been patched so it all stays together. Then it's time to once again flatten out our skin. That doesn't look very appetizing, but it will. Once we've gotten it as flat and stretched as we can, we're going to place our roulade in the center with the seam or the ugliest facet facing upward, wrap it in the skin, trim off any excess, and then commence to tying. Same deal as before, we want to tie it every one to two inches or so, but we want to tie it tighter towards the thicker parts of the breast, which will give us a more even roulade, which will help the roulade cook more evenly. Then we're just going to rub this guy down with olive oil, season with kosher salt, freshly ground pepper, rub it in to make sure that it's nice and evenly seasoned, and roast at 400 degrees Fahrenheit until the thickest part of the roulade registers about 160. I know that temperature sounds a little low for sausage, but we made the sausage ourselves. So as long as you've kept everything cold and clean, you should be good. After resting uncovered for 20 minutes so the skin doesn't get flabby, it's time to carve and see our swirl. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Hell of a lot better than the last version. Anyway, you can serve this however you like. I'm going to cut mine into rounds for easy serving. And it might not look at all like a traditional Thanksgiving meal, but you're going to get juicier meat and fuller flavor by making a roulade, which I shall now demonstrate by eating it. Just going to top it with some of the gravy that we made from the stock that we made. Make sure you always use all parts of your bird. Don't waste anything. And maybe just add a little color and herbaceousness, some freshly chopped parsley. And there you go, an easy, flavorful, pretty cool looking tur turkey key, which unlike Ted's version, doesn't taste wrong. Instead, it tastes so right it entered the clean plate club. And with that, folks, happy Thanksgiving and don't stuff a turkey into another turkey. All right, let's start off with breakfast, or at least the food most closely resembling breakfast, Thanksgiving leftover waffles. This is little more than a fun way to reheat your Thanksgiving leftovers. But when I say fun, I mean it. Really, it's as simple as lubing up your waffle iron with plenty of nonstick spray and stuffing it with stuffing until golden and crisp. For stuff like leftover mashed potatoes, you might want to add some binders. I find that one egg and about three ounces of grated cheddar cheese is all you need to turn about two cups of leftover mashed potato into a cheesy, crisp speed cheddar potato waffle. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the best sentences I've ever said. Same procedure, spray it up, squish it down, and waffle. Er, excuse me, voila. Something way better than any leftover mashed potatoes you've ever eaten. Sweet potatoes can get a little loose and goopy, so they need a little extra help. In addition to the single egg, this two cups of sweet potatoes receives two tablespoons of all-purpose flour. This is going to help the waffle bind together and not become a mushy, disappointing mass when you retrieve it from your iron. Make sure you don't overfill your waffle maker, squash it down, and toast it up. Look at that, it's a sweet potato casserole waffle. There are a few ways I could better imagine you could honor your sweet potato's memory. But then, the piece de resistance, the Thanksgiving leftover triple waffle tall stack, garnished with cranberry sauce and turkey and drizzled with gravy. Folks, I am no lover of Instagram bait food gimmicks, but I felt the need to share this with you because it genuinely rocks. If you've got kids, imagine their gaze of wonder this Sunday morning when you greet them with this mountain of Thanksgiving favorites. I do not have kids myself, but the childlike squeals of my camera crew were evidence enough that this is a good idea. Next up, we move on to lunch, where I think the leftover Thanksgiving sandwich is ripe for innovation. First up, we're going to pull the skin off our leftover turkey breast and set it aside because we have big plans for it. Then we're going to slice up the turkey breast as thin as we possibly can, and then we're taking the skin over to the stovetop where we're going to fry it up in a bit of vegetable oil. This can be a bit of a messy, sputtery process, and it might not cook very evenly, but just press it down and give it a flip and make Maybe weigh it down with a heavy saucepan, ensuring that every nook and cranny has become golden, brown, and crisp. Then we're setting these guys aside to drain on paper towels while we prepare the other elements of our sandwich. Maybe the most important of which is the bread, which we are going to toast up in butter. Only on one side, though. You will find out why shortly. 
First up, we're transporting our bread over to the assembly surface, but we're not just plopping it down on the countertop, no, no. For you see, this is the leading cause of toast sweat. So we're gonna make sure that we assemble our sandwich on a wire rack. Then I have an extremely indecent proposal for you. I want you to assemble this sandwich with the bread inside out. That's right, the beautiful golden crispy side of the bread facing inward. We'll touch on that later because now it's time to employ one of the most useful tips I've ever picked up making this show, the infamous moist maker or a central slice of bread soaked in gravy. I'm going to untoasted bread in hot gravy for a superior gravy absorption, and while that soaks, I'm going to start assembling the sandwich. First up, a generous layer of our thinly sliced turkey, followed by a thin but generous patty of leftover stuffing. Atop that goes a thin smear of cranberry sauce, our sufficiently soaked moist maker, another layer of turkey, another layer of stuffing, another layer of cranberry sauce, and then it's time for yet another one of our secret weapons, our salty, crispy fried turkey skin. Then I'm just going to smear a little sweet potato casserole on the top slice of bread, top up, and marvel at what I have created. Now, I am opposed to sandwiches that you can't fit in your mouth, so I'm going to give this thing a little squish, taking care not to destroy our moist maker, and then I'm going to skewer it and slice it into twain. And that, my friends, is how you make a Thanksgiving leftovers sandwich. The real innovation here, however, lies in the inside-out application of the toasted bread. It protects the bread from becoming mooshed by condiments, protects the roof of your mouth from getting torn up by toast, and gives the whole sandwich an unexpected potato chip-like crunch. I think it's going to revolutionize the world of sandwiches as we know it, and I'm very proud to announce here today that I have not patented it, and it is open source for your use and innovation. Enjoy. Next and last, we move on to dinner, and maybe my favorite application of Thanksgiving leftovers because it can be enjoyed year-round. I speak, of course, about the freezable Thanksgiving pot pie. You'll notice that in a large bowl, I am combining some shredded leftover turkey breasts, some roast potatoes chopped up into bite-sized pieces, Pieces, and some assorted vegetables, but you can of course mix and match based on what you have left over from the giving of thanks. Next up, I have about three cups of gravy that I've thinned with probably a half cup of chicken stock, into which I'm depositing our leftover solids and mixing to combine, and our pot pie filling is finished as easy as that. Next up, I have some store-bought puff pastry that I'm going to defrost, lightly flour, and roll out, just till it's about one and a half times its original size and no creases or folds remain. Then, from this sheet of puff pastry, we're going to cut rounds. We need to cut them about half an inch wider than the diameter of their intended container, so far Find something in your kitchen that fits the bill and get to slicing. Then once you've got a few puff pastry rounds for pot pies large and small alike, it's time to simply assemble and then either bake or freeze. That's the beauty of this recipe, it can be enjoyed either now or later. I personally like to use small ramekins like this one, or big ramekins like this one, filled to about a half an inch shy of full to account for bubblage, topped with our rounds of puff pastry that we're going to gently pat down around the edges to seal, and if you don't want to eat them now, you can give them the old home freezer preparation treatment, wrapping twice in plastic wrap and once in foil, for any time you want to experience Thanksgiving flavors over the next six months. Meanwhile, our big boys are getting the same treatment, but with two layers of puff pastry. After all, there's nothing sadder in the world than a pot pie that's all pot and no pie. Lastly, whenever you're ready to finally eat these guys, we're going to brush them down with one beaten egg. This will give our puff pastry a nice glossy sheen, and then we're going to sprinkle them liberally with some flaky sea salt. Cut a few vents with a paring knife for good luck, and then into a 375 degree Fahrenheit oven they go for anywhere from 40 minutes to one hour, especially if they're frozen. Pull them out once they're nicely golden brown and bubbling over the edges, and there you have it, the perfect way to enjoy Thanksgiving flavors year round. Please excuse my excited hands in 3, 2, 1, Ugh. but I am excited because let's face it, after day 3 or 4 of Thanksgiving leftovers, you're starting to get sick of this stuff, so it's great to be able to either zhuzh it up or save it for another day. You might notice that I'm taking a long time to eat this bite here, and that's because it's extraordinarily hot. Always exercise caution with pot pies. And since this episode comes out on Thanksgiving Day, I hope you guys had a wonderful holiday, surrounded by amazing food, people you love, and of course the people you have to love because it's Thanksgiving and their family and just have another glass of wine.
Alright, so I'm going to start the episode off by shooting myself in the foot and suggesting that you make a chicken instead of a turkey. If you're feeding one to four people, this is going to be a much more time and budget friendly option. If you're starting today, the day before Thanksgiving, we're going to start by dry brining our tur chicken. In other words, we're just going to lightly coat it with kosher salt and freshly ground pepper. Then letting it rest uncovered in the fridge overnight is not only going to deeply flavor it, it's going to help dry out the skin, which is going to make it crispier. Then if you're willing to get your hands dirty, figuratively speaking, if you're wearing gloves, you can run your fingers between the skin and the meat, separating them. This is both an opportunity to get some salt and pepper directly on the meat, and also separating the skin helps it crisp up even better. It's why Peking duck is so crispy. They inflate it like a balloon, and then hang it in the fridge for several days so the skin can dry out. But even overnight or just a few hours will make a huge difference. Another thing we want to ready up before anything else is our stock. If you're like most of us and you don't feel like making your own stock from scratch, you can amp up your store-bought stuff quite easily. We're just going to deeply brown a quartered onion along with the chicken neck if yours came with one. A little bit of neutral flavored oil like vegetable for a few minutes until it's got some nice color. Then we're going to add the core and leaves of a head of celery, the stuff that you normally throw away. Two ugliest carrots you got cut into two inch pieces. Some fresh sage and thyme if you got it. And then we're going to add a quart of store bought turkey stock. This is going to help bring back some of those Thanksgiving flavors that we're missing with the chicken. I'm also going to add a tablespoon of whole peppercorns and two dried bay leaves. Bring this guy up to a nice gentle simmer and keep him there uncovered until he's reduced by half. It's going to leave us with a nice concentrated flavorful stock that's going to be perfect for our gravy. Strain out the solids, let it cool, cover it in plastic wrap and refrigerate until ready to use. Trust me, this step is worth doing. Another dish that is super easy to make and really worth making from scratch is cranberry sauce. Get yourself a bag of cranberries and dump it into your widest and deepest saucepan. Then all you really need to add is a whole lot of sugar, about one cup or five ounces per 12 ounces of cranberries. But some very welcome additions might be a couple tablespoons of Grand Marnier, the peel and juice of one large orange, maybe a little knob of fresh ginger, and a cinnamon stick. Then we're setting this over medium-high heat and bringing the whole affair to a rolling simmer, reducing the heat to low to maintain said simmer, stirring occasionally, and cooking for 15 to 20 minutes until an almost cranberry sauce-like consistency is achieved. Then we're picking out our inedibles, tasting for seasoning, and adjusting as necessary with water, sugar, salt, being sure to bring it back to a simmer if you add any sugar, and cooking until you have the cranberry sauce of your dreams. Go ahead and let this cool, cover it, and put it in the fridge for up to two weeks. Next up, a no-fuss, no muss, no fuss, no muss, no muss, no fuss, apple pie. Or more accurately, an apple pie, apple crisp, apple tart hybrid, I'm gonna call an apple crisp tart. In a large bowl, we are combining 10 ounces of flour, four ounces of sugar, and one teaspoon of kosher salt to tiny whisking until homogenous. And then we're adding 15 tablespoons or 7.5 ounces of melted unsalted butter, gently mixing together with a rubber spatula until it has the consistency of Play-Doh. Nope, not the Athenian philosopher, the Hasbro product. Then we're grabbing about two thirds of this dough and pressing it into a nine inch removable bottom tart pan, pushing and spreading it out evenly into the corners and up the sides until you've got a relatively consistent one centimeter thick layer all around. Trim off the tops, make it look pretty, and it's time to par bake. You could also use a traditional pie plate, but it's gonna be harder to slice and retrieve and you need to be emotionally prepared for some slippage. Whatever your vessel, we're baking at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about 20 minutes or until golden brown crisp and set. To the remaining third of the pie dough, we're adding one tablespoon each flour and sugar. This will turn the mixture rather crumbly and ideally suit it for becoming a crumble. Cover and refrigerate until ready to use. Next up, we're making our pie filling. I've got six large Granny Smith apples here that I'm going to peel and then place four cuts around their core. This might not be the most efficient way to cut up an apple, but it's not that wasteful and it's far and away the easiest. We're then slicing those pieces into quarter inch slices, placing in a bowl, and rinsing and repeating with the remaining apples. If they start to turn brown, go ahead and toss them with the juice of one lemon, but it doesn't really matter if it turns brown, it's apple pie filling, it's gonna be brown. Moving those into a large bowl, and then I'm making a mixture of sugar and spice and everything nice. One cup of packed light brown sugar, two tablespoons of cornstarch, and then I'm just kinda eyeballing the rest. Two teaspoons of cinnamon, maybe a quarter teaspoon of ground clove, one teaspoon of ground allspice, half teaspoon of ground cardamom, and then if you've got whole nutmeg, well you know what they say, once you go freshly grated nutmeg, you never go back to not freshly grating your nutmeg. 
Go ahead and tiny whisk that until homogenous and then add it to the apples, mixing and tossing by hand until everybody's evenly coated and the apples are starting to give up their juices. Speaking of juices, we're going to add the zest and juice of one small lemon. If you don't want your filling to be too sharp, leave out the juice, but you gotta add the zest, trust me. And then because this filling is not going to spend as much time in the oven as a traditional pie, we need to par cook it. Into your very largest saute pan it goes with three tablespoons of foaming butter. Cooking over medium heat for about 10-15 minutes until everybody is soft and sweet and thick, just like me. Give it a taste for doneness and seasoning, adjust as necessary, maybe give it a pinch of kosher salt if that's your thing. And then we're letting this mixture cool completely, covering and refrigerating until ready to use. Last step in the pre-pie process is our crust, which is coming out of the oven looking nice and golden brown, which once completely cooled, we can wrap in plastic wrap and let rest at room temperature until we're ready to use it. For now, it's time to talk stuffing. You can totally buy croutons from the store, they're gonna be perfectly good, and they might be flavored with things like Asiago and garlic, which makes them ideal for snacking. But you will find an unquestionable improvement in your stuffing if you make your own croutons. You can use flavorful, robust breads like sourdough. You can control their size and consistency, and you can flavor them however you like. Cube up a whole loaf of bread into these maybe half-inch sized cubes. Spread them out evenly on a couple of sheet trays and place them in your oven at its lowest setting. Mine goes down to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And then dry them, tossing and rotating occasionally until they are completely dry. If you're doing this the night before, you could just leave the bread out overnight and let it stale. Next up, I, th I think we need something green in our Thanksgiving meal, and if you have to eat something green, why not drown it in bacon fat. In this ingenious method, masterminded by our new kitchen producer, Kendall Beach. Basically, we're cutting the bottoms off and cutting in half about two pounds of Brussels sprouts, giving them a toss with a little bit of olive oil, kosher salt, and freshly ground pepper. Make sure that everybody's nice and evenly coated, and then spread them out on a rimmed baking sheet, making sure that nobody's too crowded, and making sure that everybody is resting cut side down. Then, here's the genius part. You guys know how I feel about roasting bacon instead of frying it. Well, we're gonna kill roughly 15 birds with one stone by laying half a pound of medium thickness bacon, not too thick, not too thin. This can be covered and refrigerated overnight, and then we're going to bake it at 400 degrees Fahrenheit for about 20-25 minutes. It is a perfect invention, and no one can tell me otherwise. Last but not least, we need some sage sausage for our stuffing. If you cannot find sage sausage, it's easy enough to approximate. I have here a pound of ground pork, to which I'm going to add a teaspoon of kosher salt, a half teaspoon each of garlic powder and onion powder, and a whole bunch of fresh sage, about two tablespoons spoons worth finely chopped. I think that sage is kind of the genesis of where all those familiar Thanksgiving flavors come from, so do not skip the fresh sage. Mix up, cover, and refrigerate until ready to use. And that does it for the stuff that can optionally be done ahead of time. Next up, our Thanksgiving day of to-dos. First thing we're gonna work on is our stuffing, and the first thing we need for our stuffing is mirepoix, the blessed triad of finely chopped onions, carrots, and celery. What we're doing here is a ritual known as mise en place, a very important ritual on a day as busy as Thanksgiving. The more you can chop, prep, measure, and set aside your ingredients before starting to cook, the better. So in addition to my half medium onion, two small carrots, and two ribs of celery, I'm going to finely mince about two tablespoons worth of fresh sage, along with picking and chopping about a tablespoon of fresh thyme. Then we're ready to head over to the stovetop where we're going to heat a tablespoon of olive oil in our biggest Dutch oven, and in it we're going to brown and mash up our homemade sort of sausage. We just want to break it down to bite-sized pieces, get some decent color on the outside. It's okay if it's still a little pink in the middle. Then we're fishing it out with a slotted spoon, setting it aside, and in the rendered pork fat, along with two tablespoons of butter, we're going to start sautéing our mirepoix for maybe five or six minutes until it starts to soften and pick up some color. We're also going to start to warm up four cups of stock in a separate saucepan. Once our vegetables are sufficiently sautéed, we're going to start adding our herbs. One tablespoon fresh thyme, two tablespoons fresh sage, and one crushed clove of garlic I forgot to tell you to prepare earlier. Sauté these together for about 30 seconds or until fragrant, and then we're going to start deglazing the pot with a little bit of our stock. Deglazing just means adding a little bit of liquid so we can scrape up all the brown stuff off the bottom of the Dutch oven. This is where flavor resides. Then we're going to add our sausage back to the pot, and I'm going to add some chopped roasted chestnuts. This is very optional if you can find them. They have a very mild, sweet flavor, but mostly it's impressive to say I've got chestnuts in my stuffing. Mix all that together until everybody's evenly distributed, and then we're going to start adding our croutons, along with about half of the remaining warm stock. We want just enough to saturate the bread 
so don't add it all at once. Give it a mix, see how it looks, see how it tastes. Season generously with kosher salt and freshly ground pepper, and add more stock and or croutons as necessary. Once you've got it to the consistency that you like it, we're covering and keeping it warm while we work on our other stuff. This guy can be reheated on the stovetop or crisped up in the oven before serving. Next up, it's time to contend with our bird which, as you can see, has been nicely desiccated in the fridge. Now again, this is totally optional, but if you can find yourself a tub of duck fat, there's never been a better time to splurge upon it. If that's not your bag, just hit the whole bird with a light coating of olive oil. But if it is your bag, give it as generous as possible a rub down. Next up for roasting, we have some minor preparations. First, we're gonna tuck the wing tips underneath the body of the bird. This is going to prevent them from burning. Next up, we have to sort of truss the legs, for which we normally need butcher's twine, but I couldn't find mine, so in a pinch, you can actually use gauze, which is just cotton, so it's like butcher's twine in a different shape. Grab yourself a length of it, twist it into a sort of string, and tie the legs together. This is gonna help expose the thighs and drumsticks to more heat and help them cook more evenly. We're giving this guy one last coat of salt and freshly ground pepper. And as for stuffing the bird, it's generally not a good idea to stuff your poultry, because whatever you shove up in there has to be brought up to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. So why not use some stuff that you're not going to eat that's going to perfume the bird from within, like a whole head of garlic cut in half and a sliced lemon. Last up, we are roughly chopping a large onion and retrieving our very largest oven-safe saute pan, into which we're going to deposit our bird upside down. This is a popular method that protects the delicate breast meat from the heat of the oven while exposing the dark meat to the heat that it needs to become tender. We're then surrounding the bird with our chopped onion. This is going to help prevent any accumulated juices from burning or evaporating. It is then headed into a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven for about one hour. About halfway through, we're going to take it out and flip it. This way, the breast meat can finish cooking and the skin on top can be browned and crisped up. During its last half hour of cooking, we're going to add the Brussels sprouts and bacon to the oven and prepare our final side dish, some outrageously creamy mashed potatoes. Now, I recently did a basics episode of mashed potatoes. Click the link in the upper right hand corner right now if you want to see how to make all different kinds of styles, but what follows is a super simple, ultra-rich version. Here I have roughly two or three pounds of Yukon Golds that I'm peeling and cutting into one-inch cubes, placing into a large stock pot or high-walled saute pan like this one and covering with cold water. We're then going to heavily salt this water and bring the whole thing up to the boil. Once the boil is reached, we're going to cook for 15 to 20 minutes until the potatoes are completely tender and can be broken in half without effort when pierced with a piercing object. Go ahead and drain these and return them to the hot pan, where we're going to place them over very low heat and mix them to help drive off any excess moisture. Now we're going to be adding a whole stick or a half a cup of unsalted butter to these potatoes, so I'm going to melt about three tablespoons worth in a separate pan and crush in two to three cloves of garlic, allowing them to cook for 30 seconds to one minute until nice and fragrant. Once that's done, we're killing the heat under everything and adding the remaining butter, one cup of room temperature heavy cream, and our sautéed garlic and butter mixture to the potatoes. And with that, we're ready to commence to mashing. Just mash them up and mix them around until everybody's smooth, taking care not to over mash. Season heavily with kosher salt, mix it in, and like everything else we're doing today, we're tasting for seasoning. We want to make sure that everything has enough salt and or pepper before it ends up on the table. For now, we're going to cover these up and keep them warm because our chicken is headed out the oven. First things first, we're taking the bird out of the pan and setting him aside to rest for at least 15 minutes before carving and serving. Do not cover him with foil, you will ruin his nice crispy skin. Then we are straining the contents of the pan, which is going to be mostly fat, but we are taking care to leave all that beautiful brown stuff in the bottom of the pot. Set that aside because before we finish up our main courses, we need to prep our dessert. Simply pour the apple filling into the tart shell, top with our crumble, lower the oven to 350, and pop it in for 25 to 30 minutes or until golden brown. Meanwhile, over on the stovetop, we're building our pan gravy. Make sure you wrap the handle of the pan with a towel, you don't want to burn your fingies. And to the pan, we're adding two tablespoons of butter, with which we're going to build a roux. I'm adding three tablespoons of all-purpose flour, whisking to combine, and also adding about a quarter cup of our accumulated duck and chicken fat. This is going to make for an extraordinarily flavorful gravy, as is our amped up stock. Whisk constantly as we slowly add about two cups of stock to this mixture, both scraping up all the beautiful brown stuff on the bottom of the pot and preventing any lumps from forming. Just add a little bit at a time, whisking until smooth before adding any more. You might not want to add all the stock if you want a thicker gravy. Once you've added enough to suit your tastes, we're going to cook it over medium heat for about five minutes, then season generously with salt and pepper, making any necessary final adjustments to flavor and or consistency, and set aside our dream gravy for serving. We're on the home stretch now, just a couple more to-dos. First off, our Brussels sprouts are headed out the oven. They are nicely browned and the bacon is nice and crisp. Place the Brussels sprouts into your serving bowl, chop up the bacon, and top. 
Simple as that, for the best Brussels sprouts I've ever had in my life. Next up, we can optionally carve the chicken before serving, which is easier than it sounds, and it's much easier than doing at the table. If you want to see in detail how to do this, click the link in the upper right-hand corner right now. But basically, we're just removing the breasts, slicing them up, and serving them alongside the drums and thighs. Only one final step, finding the right serving vessel for our stuffing, and plating everybody up nice and pretty. And there you have it, a simple, entirely from scratch Thanksgiving dinner, totally doable in about four hours about two hours of which can be done ahead of time. The chicken is moist and juicy with lovely crisp skin. The gravy is absolutely the best gravy I've ever had in my life. The potatoes are rich and creamy. The stuffing tastes exactly how you hope stuffing tastes. The cranberry sauce is sweet and tart, and the Brussels sprouts are more bacon than they are Brussels sprouts. <laughs> All right, so once you've allowed your turkey to fully defrost, that's 24 hours in the fridge for every five pounds of bird, it's time to debag it and remove its included accessories, usually a nice neck and some giblets. These are great for making or fortifying your gravy. Next up, we're gonna pat the bird dry inside and out. If you plan on using an oven thermometer, you can go ahead and pull this thing out, making sure not to tear the skin any more than is necessary. And then it's time to talk some general turkey best practices. First up, using your fingers to separate the skin from the meat. This not only aids in crisping up the birds, but opens up the opportunity to stuff delicious things under there like butter and herbs. Matter of fact, that sounds really pretty good. Why don't we do that? To make compound butter, we're simply combining eight ounces of room temperature unsalted butter with the herbs and spices of our choice. I'm going with some freshly chopped sage, rosemary, and thyme, and a hefty pinch of kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper, which is gonna help more deeply season the meat under the skin. Go ahead and tiny whisk that together until it's homogenous, and then we can introduce it to our bird. One little gob at a time, we're gonna shove and massage it into every corner that we can get it. Most of this is gonna melt away, but it's gonna deeply flavor the meat before it goes. Still got some left over, go ahead and just rub it all over everything. Next up, we gotta talk brining. Now, if you're going with a wet brine, you wanna do that first before any of this other stuff, but I prefer a dry brine of about a half cup of kosher salt mixed with one teaspoon of baking powder, which once liberally applied to every nook and cranny of the exterior of the bird, can then hang out uncovered in the fridge for 24 hours. Now, one of the advantages of a wet brine is that it gives you very, very moist meat, but most of that moisture just ends up being salty water. It also doesn't really penetrate very deeply into the meat, two problems that we can fix in one go. I've got one cup of concentrated turkey stock that I've made by boiling down about two quarts of turkey stock to one cup, and one cup lightly melted butter, which I'm going to tiny whisk together into a rich, buttery, turkey flavor emulsion of your dreams, and administer to the turkey by virtue of a flavor injector, a giant scary meat needle that I'm going to insert repeatedly and joyfully in every part of the white and dark meat. Now before doing this, you want to know your turkey's commercial brining status. If the ingredient say anything more than turkey, in other words, salt, flavors, water added, then that means that it was probably commercially brined and you wanna make sure that your injection liquid doesn't have any added salt. Next up, we're gonna truss the legs, in other words, just tie them together, and tuck the wings underneath the front of the turkey. You will notice that there is no stuffing in this bird. That's because by the time the stuffing reaches a safe to eat temperature, the rest of the turkey is gonna be dried out. If you really wanna stuff things in there, go with a quartered onion and a halved lemon. Since you're not going to eat them, they don't need to come up to temperature and they're gonna introduce a whole bunch more flavor into the situation. So now that our turkey has been prepped and prodded in all manner of ways, it's time to talk method of cooking. First up, we're gonna go with just a classic oven roasted turkey. I'm lining the bottom of my roasting pan with aluminum foil and tossing a whole roughly chopped onion in there, one whole head of garlic, cloves separated, no need to peel, a few chopped carrots, and a few ribs of chopped celery. All these vegetables are gonna do two things, prevent the drippings from your turkey from evaporating and burning, and add even more flavor, so you get a bonus shot of concentrated stock to add to your gravy once you're done cooking. Turkey goes in a rack set over top, and then the classic method is to loosely tent with foil and pop into a 325 degree Fahrenheit oven for about two hours. This is gonna bring the turkey up to temperature in a nice, moist environment. This is great for keeping the meat moist and cooking the turkey evenly, but not so great for browning. After two hours, or once the thickest part of the breast registers about 150 degrees Fahrenheit, we're uncovering the turkey, cranking the oven up to 450 degrees Fahrenheit, preferably with convection. We're crisping up the bird for anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes. 
until the breast meat registers about 155 and the dark meat 175. Then we're letting it rest uncovered for 20 to 30 minutes. Don't worry, it won't cool off, but not before we first retrieve all those delicious drippings. Let this stuff settle for a few minutes, skim the fat off the top, and you've got some hyper-concentrated stock to add to your gravy. Once the turkey is rested, you can go ahead and carve as desired. Next up, the ever-popular oven bag method. These are available at your local grocer, and it is basically the same as the foil method, but the bag traps a whole lot more moisture. Even after cutting a half dozen ventilation slits in the top of the bag, we're still cooking the turkey in an extremely humid environment, which helps keep it moist. Same deal, 325 for about two hours or until the thickest part of the breast registers 150. Then we're going to liberate the turkey from the bag so it can crisp up. We're gonna place it on a rack so that it is elevated above all the drippings and look at all the drippings that that bag preserved. And then no matter how you're cooking your turkey, when it comes time to crisp it up, it can help to brush it down with fat. You can use clarified butter, oil, chicken, or duck fat. Before plopping it back into a 450 degree Fahrenheit oven, preferably with convection, for anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes until thoroughly browned. And I learned a valuable lesson from this bird, don't brown your turkey over the drippings. As you can see, I think the bottom browned much worse than the top because of all the steam coming off the liquid. Still, it's gonna make for good eating after its 30 minute rest. I'm gonna carve it up by carefully removing the breasts and slicing them across the grain. And not only is this turkey delicious and juicy, you can actually see the butter in the meat. Those flavor injectors are like $15 online and they're worth every penny. Next up, we're going with spatchcocking, definitely my favorite method for making a turkey, not only because you get uniformly crispy skin, but because it cooks in less than half the time. We're going to start by using some sharp kitchen shears to remove the turkey's spine. Then you can optionally remove the wishbone for easier slicing down the line. You have to place shallow cuts down the sides of the bone until you can pull it free. It's kind of a pain in the ass, but you have to ask yourself, do you want your pain in the ass now or later when you're actually serving your guests? Once you got that out of there, it's time to press the turkey flat. This is a little bit easier if you place a little snip at the base of the breastbone, flip the turkey over, and press down hard between the breasts. This gives you a sort of flat, splayed out turkey that is gonna cook more evenly. You can prepare it however you like. I like to go with a dry brine, lightly coating in the salt and baking powder mixture before resting in the fridge uncovered for 24 hours. Doing the usual thing of separating the skin from the meat so the fat can render out more effectively. And if you're not injecting flavors into the meat, you can still help to poke the skin a number of times, particularly in the thicker fat deposits. You can use a safety pin or a cocktail pick like this one. This is gonna help the fat render out even further. We're placing this on a rack set over our vegetables in a foil lined rimmed baking sheet before baking at 450 degrees Fahrenheit, preferably with convection, for only like 45 minutes until the thickest part of the breast registers 155 and the dark meat 175. It comes out looking a little strange and dare I say inappropriate, but you're not going to have a juicier bird with crispier skin, especially in only about 45 minutes. Now let's take a crack at a smoked turkey, which I'm going to make an optional butter and spice rub for, inspired by AmazingRibs.com. I've got a half cup of melted clarified butter to which I am adding one and a half teaspoons kosher salt, one one teaspoon each dried sage, dried rosemary, dried thyme, three quarters of a teaspoon dried oregano, half teaspoon black pepper, half teaspoon onion powder, one teaspoon paprika, and two tablespoons of brown sugar. I'm injecting the meat with melted and cooled salted butter and rubbing the spice and butter mixture all over and under the skin. We're also not trussing or stuffing our bird before placing it in a 325 degree Fahrenheit smoker for about two hours. Once again, increasing the heat to about 450 to crisp up the bird in the last half hour of cooking. This produces a smoky spiced bird with crispy skin and juicy meat. Don't forget that little nugget of meat in the back. This is called the Pope's Nose, and it is recognized the world over as a snack exclusively for the chef. Last but not least, the scariest, most difficult, and most delicious way to prepare your bird, deep frying. We've got our butter-injected and dry brine bird threaded onto the, um grappling hook, which we're going to start by lowering into an empty deep frying pot. We're then going to add cold oil until it's just covered and pull it back out. This is the best way to determine how much oil you need in your deep fryer. Once the turkey's out and the oil's in, it's time to activate the jet engine, apply heat-proof gloves and goggles, not only because it's stylish, but because it's safe. And once your oil reaches 325 degrees Fahrenheit, it's time to kill the flame. This will prevent a fire from breaking out in the event of an accidental overflow. And with the flame off, very, 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 very slowly lowering your turkey. You don't want oil to, say, rush into the cavity and cause a big splash, which burns your arm off. Then we're letting it deep fry for anywhere from half an hour to 45 minutes, about three and a half minutes per pound. Trying to maintain the oil temperature at 325 as best we can, and starting to check the temperature of the white meat after about 30 minutes. Once the turkey has reached its target temperature, it's time to once again turn off the flame, and just about as slowly as we put it in, very, very slowly take it out. That turkey's full of hot oil, and you don't want it dripping all over the place. Deep frying a turkey can cause severe injury, 
house fires, premature hair loss, and all manner of terrible things, but it produces far and away the juiciest meat, crispiest skin, and the most anxiety that you'll get during Thanksgiving. We actually ended up overcooking this turkey by 10 degrees, and you can still see it's very juicy. And of all the turkeys that we made, it's the one we ended up eating the most of. And that's after having eaten nothing but turkey all day. Screw it. Bring on the yams. <laughs> well, but you've, you've worked so hard. Yams! Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just want to say that I'm real sorry for whatever I, I did to you in high school. Oh, it wasn't just me. We had a club. You had a club? That's right. The I Hate Rachel Green Club. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're taking a look at the yams from Friends, which I'm guessing were not yams at all, but sweet potatoes like these ones. Here in the States, the word yam and sweet potato are used interchangeably, but they are an entirely different genus of things. And since real yams are typically imported from tropical climates, the domestic sweet potato is going to be our weapon of choice. I've got three large ones here, about four pounds worth, that I'm going to peel and cut into one-inch chunks. It doesn't have to be an exact science. You want them to be roughly the same size, so they cook at roughly the same rate. As we cook them the way we would most potatoes, in cold water brought to a boil. Once we've heavily salted these guys and brought them up to a simmer, we're cooking for 12 to 15 minutes until completely cooked through and showing no resistance when stabbed with a paring knife. This is going to be the foundation for our super basic sweet potato casserole. Go ahead and drain these and put them in a big old bowl, along with some enhancements. 8 ounces of light brown sugar, 4 ounces of unsalted melted butter, a teaspoon of vanilla extract, a generous pinch of kosher salt, and get to mashing. Now, sweet potatoes are pretty fibrous little tubers. So you're not going to get these super smooth with a potato masher, but they'll still be very, very good. Generously grease a 9x13 pan with nonstick spray. Spread them out nice and evenly, but it doesn't matter if you get them super smooth because we're going to top them with something I wasn't allowed to have on my yams as a child, marshmallows. An entire 10 ounce bag of the mini variety. Spread those out nice and evenly, and then this guy's headed into a 325 degree Fahrenheit oven with the rack set in the lowest position for anywhere from 25 to 30 minutes until the marshmallows are golden brown and have coalesced into a pebbly marshmallow marshmallow singularity. Let that sit for 5-10 to 10 minutes before serving, and that's all there is to it. A super simple, unbelievably delicious sweet potato casserole. Now, despite going from raw sweet potato to casserole in under an hour, it's got to be the best sweet potato casserole I've ever tasted, maybe because I've never tried it with marshmallows before. So what can we possibly do to improve on an already perfect food? Well, we're going to have to get pretty nitpicky. Now, this recipe is going to be kind of an amalgamation of improvements. You can take any one of them and apply it to the last recipe, and it will have an effect. First up, instead of boiling our sweet potato cubes, we're going to sous vide them. Food scientist Harold McGee has pointed out that sous viding sweet potatoes at 170 degrees Fahrenheit activates some kind of enzyme or something that makes them naturally sweeter, so we don't have to use quite as much sugar. This is going to be far and away the most optional step because it is the biggest pain in the ass, especially when you accidentally make your bag too big. So go ahead and subdivide your potatoes into two smaller bags, maybe with a cinnamon stick or two, and then drop them into a 170 degree Fahrenheit water bath for one and one half hours, weighing down if necessary to make sure that they're submerged. Now this is going to do that enzyme sweetness thing, but it's also going to mostly cook the potatoes so that they're ready to mash up when they come out of the sous vide. So while these guys float, we're going to make some brown butter. Dumping 5 ounces of unsalted butter into a medium saucepan, swirling pretty constantly over medium heat until the milk solids separate and start to turn a nutty brown. Set aside to cool, and then 90 minutes later we got ourselves some potatoes. Go ahead and fetch these out of Davy Jones's miniature locker, and place them in a large bowl along with more enhancements. Our brown butter, make sure you get all those little brown bits. 4.5 ounces of light brown sugar, 4 ounces of creme fraiche, 2 tablespoons of maple syrup, 1 tablespoon of vanilla paste or a teaspoon of vanilla extract, half teaspoon ground cinnamon, quarter teaspoon freshly grated nutmeg, generous pinch of kosher salt, and for both structure and richness, 3 beaten egg yolks. Go ahead and mix those all together with a paddle until evenly distributed, but you'll notice that I'm not mashing, and that's because I'm gonna puree. The only way to break down all that fibrous junk in the sweet potatoes is with the power of a food processor, blitzing for about 60 seconds in batches until extremely smooth. Once again, we're placing this in a 9 by 13 casserole, this time generously lubed up with unsalted butter. Spread it around nice and evenly. Whatever you do, don't taste it because it has eggs in it. Andy, Andy, I said no tasties. God, you're difficult. So now for an added flavor explosion, we're going to make ourselves a pecan streusel. Combining 4.5 ounces of all-purpose flour, 6 ounces of brown sugar, and 4.5 ounces of roughly processed pecans. This kind of undoes any sugar savings that we got from our sous vide process, so do this at your own 
risk. Once all the dry ingredients are combined, we're going to add two and a half ounces of melted butter, adding more as necessary until the streusel has the texture of very wet sand. Press it together and crumble it over the top of the sweet potatoes, and then this guy's headed into that 325 degree Fahrenheit oven for the same 25 to 30 minutes, during which time we can make our whiskey marshmallow topping. We're starting by dissolving half an ounce or two packets of unflavored gelatin in five ounces of cold water, setting that aside to set, and then making a sugar syrup. Into a small saucepan goes six ounces of sugar, two ounces of water, one ounce of light corn syrup, and two ounces of the Singleton 12-year-old single malt scotch whiskey. Whisk this together gently to combine and place over medium heat, covering and bringing to a simmer. Once it's simmering, take off the lid, and then we're going to cook this to 255 degrees Fahrenheit, otherwise known as the firm ball stage. Once that temperature is reached, kill the heat, add a little splash of whiskey, and set aside to cool, down to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, during which time we're going to set our gelatin over a double boiler to melt it, and combine it and our 212 degree Fahrenheit sugar syrup in the bowl of a stand mixer. Then using our wire whisk attachment, we're going to whip this guy on medium high speed, starting off slow of course, for up to 10 to 15 minutes until it's damn near quadrupled in volume and it's reached the stiff peak stage. And with that, my friends, you have made homemade whiskey marshmallow, which you could pour into a casserole and cut into cubes for traditional marshmallows, or before it sets, you can pipe it onto your slightly cooled casserole. You want it just cooled enough that it doesn't melt the marshmallow. Then you can let this set in then you can let this set for an hour and put it in a 350 degree Fahrenheit oven to brown it. Or if your casserole is still hot and you want to eat it right now, you can use a torch. And there you have it, the ultimate super smooth, super sweet, super crunchy, super creamy, super marshmallowy sweet potato casserole. I don't have footage of it, but we picked at this throughout the day and the three of us almost finished the entire thing. Now all we need is an accompanying cocktail for our holiday meal. I'm thinking of maple old fashioned, for which I'm going to make a quick little orange peel garnish. And then I'm constructing this cocktail in the glass, so I got a big old ice cube here. Then over top, I'm going to pour one and a half ounces of the Singleton 12, a little splash of club soda, which I like because it kind of lightens things up, a few dashes of your favorite bitters, and about a teaspoon of maple syrup to taste. This plays really nice as a sweetener in an old fashioned. Mix everybody together thoroughly by virtue of your bar spoon, garnish with your orange twist, and there you have it, a maple old fashioned. A perfect pairing for our sweet potato casserole or whatever else Thanksgiving throws at you. It's finally here. The brand of cooking tools that made you rethink just how good tongs could be is coming to your stovetop. The Babish Cookware line of cookware. Available now. Check the link in the video description. Okay, and this is moist. Take one. It says maker down there. Oh, little time. oh yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Okay, moist maker. <laughs> Folks, it's that magical time of year when we all eat too much and watch football and the uh, children sing their favorite Thanksgiving carols. And uh, I have been told that I screwed up the moist maker. I was told that I did not soak the moist maker, the gravy soaked piece of bread in the middle of the sandwich, for long enough. So I've decided to do it all over again. <laughs> and this time I'm going to soak the bread for like five seconds longer. Let's get started. So first thing we gotta do is make our stuffing. I have here a loaf and loaf of artisanal bread that I'm going to dissect into cubes, which I'm then going to toast uh, until the, the low and slow until all the moisture has been driven out of the bread and that's going to make them into croutons. And then I'm going to turn those croutons into stuffing. Hi, what do you got there? What is that? Dates. Why are you opening a box of dates? Do you want to record your dating reel? Like an acting reel? Who calls it a dating reel, Brad? <laughs> don't they have, is it, wasn't that a thing? Yeah, like video, video dating? dating, but I don't think they ever called it a dating reel. Oh. Let's all, yeah, let's all do our dating reels. Cause my, my dating reel, I think on paper, doesn't sound so great. Hey guys, this is my dating reel. I'm Andrew, I'm 34, I'm bald, I'm a YouTuber, and I grind my teeth really loudly. So now, to turn these into croutons, I'm going to spread them out evenly on a couple of uh, rimmed baking sheets. So now we're putting them in a 200 degree oven for probably about an hour uh, to really, probably about an hour and a half for probably about two hours to really dry them out. 
And uh, then we ha we'll have croutons, we'll be able to make stuffing out of them. And uh, we'll see you right after that. So here's the man of the hour. Here's why we're spatchcocking the bird, otherwise known as butterflying. Because when a turkey goes into the oven like this, it's just a big old frickin' ball of meat. And the breasts are the part of the bird that are most exposed to the heat, and they are the most delicate part. They the part that we do not want to overcook. So by butterflying the bird, by cutting out the spine, flattening it, not only are we exposing the dark meat down here to more heat from the oven, we're also reducing the amount of time that the whole thing takes to cook through. If you stuff this bird, that stuffing needs to hit 165 to be safe. By that time, your breasts are up at 185, 190, and they're dry as a bone, which is why I do not stuff my turkeys, generally speaking. So we're gonna spatchcock it, and that process is as easy as it is fun. Why, how? How is this affixed in here? What is this sorcery that they've done to this? Oh my God, what manner of device? What kind of speculum did they put in this? Some no! <laughs> Damn it! Into my eyes. Can you get salmonella through your eyes? Yeah. Well, I'm about to. I got this horrible device out of the bird, and now we have to do two things. We have to cut out the spine, we have to cut, the, cut out the wishbone. That's gonna make it easier to carve down the line. We wanna stay as close to the spine as possible, otherwise the, uh, the um, thigh can kind of fall apart. This is Jess's favorite set of noise, noises. Should we do some spatchcocking ASMR here? Because it sounds so pleasant. Sure, Brad. F pervert. Oh, you gotta really kind of get in there. Oh, yeah. Look at that. That's, that's uh, flavor. Uh, what's that thing at the bottom called? Remember? That's the... It's the... It has a Pope something. Pope's nose. Pope's, oh, the nose. Pope's nose. I was gonna say the Pope's... Goiter. Uh, so now we have to find the wishbone. Getting it out is a very onerous task. Also, it just it precludes you from being able to make a wish. Just like learning that Santa Claus isn't real, you got to learn that uh, wishes aren't real either, and that uh, your dreams don't come true, and that uh, you die alone. Donnie Darko, two thousand one. Uh, hi. Oh, you. Hi. Oh, it's. <laughs> <laughs> This is Doobie, aka Tina, aka Doobie Doobie Up, TikTok star extraordinaire, uh, and YouTube star extraordinaire, as I understand. Uh, 600,000 subscribers in uh, some, some odd weeks. Congratulations. Pretty cool. Thank you. Uh, we're going to make a gross wish. Uh, whoever gets the longer piece, I guess, gets it. Here we go. One, One two, two, three. three. Oh. You win, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> One, One, two, three. Oh, no, it's, it's, so not, it's not as fun. Oh. Oh. No. You got the wish. <laughs> I wish that we didn't do that. <laughs> so now all we have to do is flatten our bird out by, uh, I believe Jake Kenji Lopez Alt refers to it as a little bit of uh, home chiropractor e. Oh, <laughs> God. It's always so visceral to do this, but guess what? It's worth it. What we have here is. Uh, you know, probably about half a cup of kosher salt to maybe a teaspoon of baking powder, I'd say. But the baking powder is going to uh, lower the temperature at which the Maillard reaction occurs, so we end up with crispier skin. So I'm just hitting it very liberally, but uh, conservatively. I'm <sighs> so this is a centrist turkey? This is a centrist turkey, Brad. This is a uh, libertarian turkey. It's, it, it, it believes in self-reliance, self self-sufficiency. It believes in small uh, cluckerment, small gobblement, government, gov gov government, whatever. It's, yeah, it's a sure. It's a centrist turkey, and that's why it's dead. Another minor improvement we're making to this recipe is last time I made stock from the spine and the spine alone. And as a result, not only was it very light, it wasn't as flavorful as it could have been. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some store-bought turkey stock, I'm gonna fortify it with our, our turkey spine, our turkey neck, and some aromatics. This is a great way to amp up your store-bought stock and make it taste homemade. I just delivered that entire thing in, in, in impeccably. All right, cleaver time, because I, I experienced some performance issues 
with my rabbit a couple weeks ago, and I don't want that again. It happens to a lot of guys. As I understand, it happens to men over six foot. Oh man, I love a good cleaver. That's great. I'm gonna cut this up into like two inch segments, just so the, uh, the stock gets lots of exposure to that delicious spinal fluid. And there's the Pope's Okay, <laughs> not anymore. Now to give the stock a little bit more flavor and color, I'm going to brown the turkey pieces in a little bit of oil before adding the liquid and aromatics. I'm dro dropping in my turkey parts. Now, uh, prepping vegetables for a stock is a very delicate, uh, uh, precise pro- Done. Okay, we got some good color on our turkey bits. Not bad smells either. I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> That's RoboCop. Now just because as you can see the fond on the bottom is getting a little dark, something that can help with that is adding more stuff to the pot. That creates steam that prevents stuff from sticking and burning. Sleeves around a little bit, getting some good color. Get some good fond on the bottom of the pot. You know what that is, folks? That is a one-way ticket to Flavorville. Try to sue me for that, guy. Try. Don't, please don't try. Oh God, I made a huge mistake. I'm also gonna throw in a handful of fresh thyme. Always nice. A couple bay leaves. Don't fully understand what they do, but they do something. And now I'm gonna cover it with 12 whopping cups of store-bought turkey stock. And this stuff normally tastes like the inside of a dog's ass, but most of us already doing a whole lot around Thanksgiving, so adding stock to the mix, generally not the best or funnest idea. Uh, this way, just by simmering these together for a couple hours, you're gonna amp up the turkey flavor in your stock and by extension, by proxy, your gravy. Knowledge. Okay. You hear that, folks? That's the sound of flavor, not really. It's just the sound of our bread being dried out and now it's croutons and now it can cool off and it can become our stuffing. Long story short, that is pretty short actually, so I think we're good, right? Now's the, now's the easiest part of the day, folks. Oh. <laughs> uh, we are going to make some cranberry sauce and that is as easy as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, oop, I guess that counts as 110, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, uh, 21, and uh, 22. It's a 22 step, step process. We're gonna bring this to a simmer and cook it for probably about 30 minutes uh, until it's thick and cranberry sauce like. Wouldn't that be uh, 23? Like the Jim Carrey movie? Oh God. To prep the turkey for roasting. First off, I'm going to chop up some aromatics, some mirepoix, uh, no skinning, because these are just being used as drip catchers, because we're gonna place the turkey on a wire rack, set in a rim baking sheet to roast at a very high temperature. And a lot of drippings, a lot of fat are gonna come off that bird. We, we don't want it to burn. And if we just have a bare bottom of the tray, too much liquid is gonna evaporate in the heat of the oven. It's gonna burn, it's gonna smoke, it's gonna ruin Thanksgiving. Uh, so, <clears throat> I get the burps are only funny to me. I, I laugh. It's very easy to make you laugh. Look, watch this. Mm. <laughs> I'm just doing a rough chop on my onions. We're just using these, prevent burning, and yada yada, and blah da blah, and kill me, it's fine. <laughs> Brad! 
All right, let's line this guy with some aluminum foil. I'm going to dump all of our aromatics onto. Ah, my eyes! <sighs> okay. So. Uh, okay. Okay. So. <laughs> so. Uh, hey, smiles. Hey. We try to get into. Your apron. <laughs> <laughs> I have my bird set here on my rack of aromatics. So now this guy's ready to go into our 425 degree Fahrenheit convection oven for probably about 45 minutes until the breasts register buck 55 and the thighs and dark meat register hopefully around like 175. Kendall, would you do the honors for me? Thank you. Oh, that rack's too high. Uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. Oh, thank you. I've had a bad track record with hot. Uh, racks. <laughs> all right, folks, it's the moment we've all been waiting for. The turkey's coming out of the oven. Oh yeah, look at how beautiful it is. This is the kind of all over brown, all over crisp skin that you cannot get with a traditional cooking method. Let's take a listen, shall we? Oh, oh no. Oh no, oh no. What, did somebody replace the skin on this turkey with Murano glass? Let's temp it. Oh no. Oh no. Buck 47. We're gonna go a little bit longer, folks. That's turkey for you. So this was the moment we're waiting for to still wait. What's happening? All right, so our stock's been going for about an hour and a half. Hopefully it's reduced by about four cups. We're about to find out. And something I want to do is a blind taste test, starring none other than cameraman Brad. Brad, you ready? I'm not blind. Ooh. So Brad, come on over here and I'm gonna to prove to you for the last time <laughs> that simmering uh, aromatics in, and, and turkey in your, uh, okay, all right, well, okay, you're ahead of me on the blindfold, that's cool. No, you're good, right here, Sorry. right here, right there. There you go, tall stuff. All right, Brad. Okay. You ready? I think so. I'm going to give you a little bit of stock number one. I'm kind of nervous it's gonna burn my mouth. It's not gonna burn your mouth, I okay. promise. I'm gonna blow on it. Ready? Here comes the tray. I'm gonna put it on the base of your lip first, and now we're gonna dump it back. There we go. That's stock number one. Okay. Now let's try out stock number two. One, two, and three. Number one tastes substantially better. What the <laughs> Wait. No, that, no, no, that, that's correct. Oh, <laughs> I was saying that with a big, I was saying that with a big <laughs> smile on my face. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, number one is like noticeably, like you can, strikingly like, yeah, better. Yeah, I can take that. It's strikingly better. Yeah, no, it really is. and uh, I don't know why we needed to prove this. No, take it off. Yeah, take it off. She really doesn't like the whole no, mask on the like eyes thing. It's a unicorn horn, but also not a unicorn horn. No, it looks like you have a dude's package on your forehead. <laughs> that's what it looks like. <laughs> I love that. That's. Kendall's version of like <laughs> some guy's package sitting on your forehead is a, 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 it's like a unicorn horn. horn. <laughs> Damn. Thank you very much for your time. Yes. And uh, right. it's always a pleasure to have you. And uh, I'll see you right over there. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. All right. good, it's been see a good you, time. See you next time. All right, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take this. Look, look, here I am. Now, now I'm here. We're here. Oh, look at that bird. Look at that bird. And the thickest part of this breast, I'm clocking 162, could not be more perfect. So, I'm going to let this guy rest for at least half an hour before carving. It will stay hot. The skin will stay shatteringly crisp. My God, my holy sweet Jesus of Lord of Nazareth. That's really crispy. <laughs> but the cool part about this episode is we're gonna let it rest entirely, because it's supposed to be a leftover sandwich. Another thing that I think I botched, honestly, because I ate the sandwich hot. I had everything hot, fresh out of the stove, as though it was a Thanksgiving dinner, and then I made it into a sandwich. That's not what a leftover sandwich is.
We gotta make some stuffing. First thing I'm gonna do is make some impromptu pork sausage. So we got a pound of pork, some chopped fresh sage, maybe about a tablespoon's worth. Got one clove of crushed garlic, and uh, I'm just gonna hit with a little S&P as well. 500. I'm gonna squish it together, and you can do this ahead of time, but we're doing everything at once here because that is how we do things, because we aren't good at time management. Sage advice. Sage advice, you son of a bitch. You know, because like the, the sausage is, it has wisdom. We're heading over to the stove top now. We're gonna saute the uh, sausage first, get some nice browning on it, and then we're going to saute the onions and celery and some other um, uh, herbs, and then we're gonna toss it all together with stock and croutons, and that is going to be our delicious Thanksgiving stuffing. Got it? Good. Do you want new eggs? And eggs. Plop. We're gonna brown that up the same way we would if we was making Hamburger Helper. It's not the most pleasant looking thing in the world. What do you mean? Let's get this out of here. A lot of fat in this pan. We don't need all this damn fat. We just need a little bit of fat. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm gonna use all of it. Never mind. We, we want all this fat. <laughs> and now for the sizzle. Not as, not as good as I'd hoped. Folks, we're gonna have a full Thanksgiving meal here. <laughs> we're eating like kings tonight. Or pilgrims. And let's get these guys together. Cooled drained sausage in with the breadcrumbs. Got my sauteed uh, vegetables going in there. Ooh, I like that. I have some. It's chopped parsley, a bunch of chopped fresh sage, and a little bit of picked fresh thyme. And now I'm just gonna give these guys a little toss together, try to cool off those vegetables because we have to add stock and we have to add an egg and I don't wanna cook anybody. To prevent the eggs from scrambling, I'm going to temper them with a bit of warm stock, which will hopefully be a thing that works. What does tempering mean? Tempering means slowly adding a bit of warm liquid to eggs, which basically denars the and then it's for temperature. So it's, uh, it prevents, <laughs> can you explain the science behind this? Um, well, it's really simple, it's just to bring in, so if eggs are refrigerated or cold and stock is at 90 degrees, you're gonna be bringing up the overall temperature of the eggs, just somewhere in the middle there. Um, typically you do this with hotter liquids, you do it really slowly a little bit at a time, so it can come up to like an even higher temperature without scrambling. But in this case, we're just kind of taking like a medium step and this can be added to stuff that's even hotter, but it'll be okay. Nerd. All right, so I tempered my eggs with a little bit of stock and now I'm gonna mix those in with some more stock. I want everybody to get really nicely saturated. I want it to be able to stick together. I wanna be able to pick it up in fistfuls and be able to press it together into a big, Wonderful mass. That's good, see? It's like a, it's like a stuffing snowball. <laughs> this is what you want, right? <laughs> no, oh my God, I'm not a monster. Could I? Could I bring myself to do it? To throw a jagged ball of wet, sloppy meat into Kendall's face? You want me to hand feed you a little bit of this? Yeah. Come here, baby bird. <laughs> You know, no, it's okay, you're safe, you're good, you're okay, you're okay, good. <laughs> that is the most degrading thing I've ever done to a person. Well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna grease the uh, pan up with schmaltz or chicken fat because that's gonna taste good. And I see no reason why I shouldn't shove a little bit of this chicken fat in here. Just kind of get it in there and just kind of, just kind of get it in there, you know? Just kind of get it in there. Trying to mix it up, just get it in there. You just gotta, sometimes, you just gotta get it in there. We got our stuffing stuck into a casserole, and now this guy's headed into a 400 something degree oven for some amount of time. So now, last thing we have to do is make gravy. Um, I've burned myself, Jess just hacked off a big hunk of her finger. Uh, Kendall is dead. And uh, I'd had an idea that instead of butter, I'm going to use chicken fat in my gravy. To make this gravy, I'm going to use roughly three tablespoons of fat. So I'm actually gonna do a little bit more flour 
than what Kendall recommended to me because I think she was looking at my old recipe, which frankly is inadvisable because I was a dumb young man when I, when I came out with this episode. To wit, I have an apology to make. I made a really dumb, simple-minded dude joke uh, in this episode that, that I've regretted to this day. Uh, so this is a botched that needs to be unbotched, which is, I said, I like my gravy the way I like my women, thin and rich. And that is not only untoward, it's untrue. <laughs> I don't like thin, who likes thin gravy? That's disgusting. Rich, yes, sure, I like rich gravy, but it wasn't rich. I didn't thicken it enough and I didn't want to do it again, so I just made a joke about it, a bad joke. And, uh, and you all suffered the consequences. And so I, 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 from the bottom of my heart, apologize for that crack, because uh, I'm not proud of it, I'm not happy with it, and uh, it's very 2017. No, it's 2016. It was very 2016, okay? But how do you like your chickens? Fatty. <laughs> Speaking of chicken fat chickens, I have about a quarter cup of chicken fat here, about four tablespoons. Got about four tablespoons of flour. Just gonna dump that right in there. Start whisking it together to form, what's it called, Brad? Uh, um, uh. A roux. Uh, we were <laughs> making a uh, nice thin blonde roux here. It's a little bit darker than a blonde roux. I just wanna get a little color in there. Now what we're gonna do is start slowly adding in our stock. Once we've added a little bit, we're gonna whisk it until it forms a smooth paste. That way, we're going to ensure lumpless gravy. There's a little bit more. See, look at all those lumps. 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 And they're gone. Look at that, folks. Is it true that blonde roux have more fun? Right. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Un, I'm trying to undo the damage done with my earlier joke. So uh, making jokes about blondes. It's not my mo. But yes, they do. Oh, I can hear Kendall breaking ice upstairs with her therapy group. She's she's doing ice breakers. <laughs> or is it her dating reel? Ah, uh, see. Okay. Brad's better at callbacks than I am. I'm here to uh, make the food and look good. <laughs> All right, folks, stuffing's ready to come out of the oven. All right, folks, stuffing's ready to come out of the oven. All right, folks, stuffing's ready to come out of the oven. All right, folks, stuffing's ready to come out of the oven. Ah! Kendall, what's about to happen? Uh, All right, stuffing's ready to come out of the oven. Oh my gracious. Would you look at that stuffing? I mean, it's straight out of the damn thing, straight out of the oven. I'm not gonna blow on it. Nope, it's not hot. Nope, it's fine. No, it's fine. I'm gonna eat the corner. It's fine. The corner's the coolest part. No, it's fine. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Do you want water? Uh-uh. That's really good. That's gonna make a great sandwich. <laughs> Next moment we've been waiting for, take 12. Now, the uh, uh, bread is almost ready to come out. Actually, I think it's ready to come out of them, so I'm gonna go check it on it right now. Oh yeah, that's looking good. That is a nice kind of like brown, you know. I want it toasted on one side, but not necessarily the other. As you can see, not as toasted on this side. This is gonna be better for the outside of the sandwich because it's not gonna crunch and sort of you know, mess up the roof of your mouth there. Now we have all of our elements here, we just have to put the damn thing together. We do have our toast here. The beauty of toasting it in the oven is not only that it wastes a lot of energy, but also <laughs> that it sticks to the <laughs> What is that I don't know, it's glued. Oh. <laughs> you gotta be me. We just need one that looks halfway decent, just one. Hello, <laughs> there's our winner. So it is assembly time, and I have to butcher a turkey. Be it's fine. I'll take extra safety precautions and use these knife-proof gloves. Let's get moist. I'm sorry, I am, I am trying to be genuinely extra careful, which is why I'm not talking as much while I do this. Okay, okay. In the meantime, Jess can host the, the, the show. Today on Botch by Babish, we learn a very important lesson Please be careful with sharp things so as to not end up like this. I'm gonna to try to construct this with structural integrity first and foremost. So, I'm throwing down some, some sea sauce, some sea berry S on the bottom and top of the sandwich, followed by 
white meat on the bottom. Press that down so it's nice and even. I'm gonna do stuffing on both layers, a little thin layer, a little like a patty of stuffing. It's cooled off, it's totally cooled off. There we go, nice little. <laughs> Yep, yeah, it's so cold, brr, brr, oh no. All right, now comes the slice of gravy soaked bread. I'm just gonna give my gravy a whisk because it is cooled off. Make sure that it's nice and smooth. And this is the whole purpose for this episode, is making sure that this layer of bread is thoroughly soaked in gravy. So I'm not going to let it sit for even one second less than it ought to. Brad, cue dramatic music, please. Oh boy. I mean, the fact that this bread is untoasted already, it's got so much more gravy happening than the uh, previous iteration. I'd call that a piece of gravy soaked bread, would you not? Am I crazy? I'm not crazy. Okay. There we go. Now onto this layer. For me, I'm gonna do white meat for structural integrity, just because I think it's gonna to stay together a little better. Now another layer of a stuffing kind of patty. So last time I cut it in half like this. Big mistake. Any given sa any sandwich worth a damn should be cut diagonally. Et voila. There we have it, folks. The ultimate Thanksgiving leftover sandwich, the moist maker, executed to perfection. Only one thing left to do, go to sleep. <sighs> it's a messy bastard, but it's Thanksgiving and a bite. Hmm. Until next time, this has been Bosch by Babish. Keep screwing up. I will if you will. Do I have gravy on my beard? Surprisingly, what no. about now? Excuse me, sir. Would you like to try a Thanksgiving bowl? It is an entire meal of turkey, stuffing, mashed potatoes with gravy, string beans, cranberry sauce, pumpkin pie, and an Andes mint rolled into a bowl, battered, and deep fried. Dude, you didn't ask him any questions. This is true, but it's clear he likes our balls. <laughs> Balls. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're taking a look at the Thanksgiving balls from Psych, which, being an entire Thanksgiving dinner rolled into a ball and deep fried, necessitates that we make an entire Thanksgiving dinner. We had a lot to do and only about 10 minutes to do it, so I'm not going to waste any time. First, a single flawless sheet of parchment paper, which we're going to crumple up into a ball. This not only makes it look like garbage, discouraging theft, but it's going to make a great liner for our store bought pie shell. That's right, it's a frozen pie shell. I was going to make my own, but then I remembered that we're going to mash this thing into a ball. So now we're lining it with our crinkly parchment paper, filling it to the rim with pie weights or pie beans, par baking per the package parameters, removing the pie beans, and returning to the oven to bake until golden brown. So there you have it, a store-bought pie shell. Let's pretend that we made this all on our own, allowing it to cool completely while we prepare the specified filling. Into a bowl goes half a cup each granulated sugar and light brown sugar, tablespoon of flour, half teaspoon ground ginger, quarter teaspoon allspice, quarter teaspoon nutmeg, teaspoon of cinnamon, half teaspoon of kosher salt, two eggs cracked simultaneously for spectacle, one can of pumpkin puree, two teaspoons spoons of vanilla paste, and one cup of heavy cream. Whip with a wire whisk until smooth, and just like that, you got pumpkin pie base. Pour into the prepared pastry, and this guy's ready to bake at 375 for 25 to 30 minutes until just set but very wobbly, then turning off the oven and allowing the pie to cool completely in the off oven, which is going to cool the custard down gradually and prevent it from cracking. You're going to close the oven door there, Andy? Oh, never mind. Ghost's got it. Next up, stuffing. Now we have a stuffing basics coming out next week. Keep an eye out for that. So we'll save the fancy stuffing for then. For now, we're just drying out a loaf of bread cut into one inch cubes in a low oven or left out overnight. Then over on the stovetop, we're browning a pound of sage sausage. Then half small chopped onion, letting that sweat for three to five minutes, adding one clove crushed garlic, teaspoon of rosemary, tablespoon of fresh sage, sauteing for about 30 more seconds or until fragrant, and then dumping over our dried bread cubes. Then we're starting to add stock at first about a cup, starting to soak the bread and cool off the meat and veg so that we can add one beaten egg. Then mixing and slowly adding stock until the desired consistency is achieved. 
pour into a buttered cast iron skillet and roast. 375 for 30 to 45 minutes until lightly browned and cooked through. Now for the green beans, I didn't want to do the usual green bean casserole. I wanted to try something else. Green beans, amandine. We're starting by parboiling the green beans for three to four minutes while we melt three tablespoons of butter and one tablespoon of olive oil in a large skillet. Once hot and foamy, we're adding a quarter cup of slivered almonds, letting those toast for about two minutes before adding two cloves of thinly sliced garlic. Saute for about 30 seconds or until fragrant before skimming the green beans out of the water and dumping them straight in. Saute everything together for another one to two minutes. Ooh. Cool flames, then season to taste with freshly ground salt and kosher pepper. Now I am a green bean casserole obsessive, and I gotta say this is a pretty good option in a pinch. Only takes about 15 minutes and less than 10 ingredients. Next up, a nice and simple Yukon Gold Mash. Peeling and cutting three large Yukon Golds into one inch cubes, covering them with cold water, adding two cloves of garlic and a sprig of thyme, bringing to a boil and cooking for about 15 minutes, until the potatoes can be passively pierced with a paring knife. Then I'm returning the potatoes to low heat and cooking them for about 30 seconds to drive off excess moisture before seasoning them with white pepper, kosher salt, and adding one cup of steaming milk and four tablespoons of melted butter. Mash to a state of mashedness, taste for seasoning, and it's time for turkey. We don't need much, so I'm just doing a leg that I'm going to place on a rack over a bed of mirepoix, helping to prevent fat from dripping down and burning. There's going to be a lot of it. Got one cup of butter here that I'm adding various spices to, garlic powder, onion powder, cayenne pepper, white pepper, kosher salt, and I'm going to use this to base the bird. First, giving it a healthy initial brushing before placing into a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven, preferably with convection for anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, taking it out to baste it every 15 or so and making sure to rotate it so that it gets even heat. Eventually we're just looking for the skin to be brown and for the meat to register at least 175 degrees Fahrenheit at its thickest point. And for a last minute small scale Thanksgiving option, it's pretty good. You got nice crispy skin, juicy meat, but none of it means anything without cranberry sauce. One pound of fresh cranberries, cup of water, cinnamon stick, star anise pod, freshly grated nutmeg, zest and juice of one orange. Get it up to a simmer and hold it there for about 30 minutes. Fish out your star anise and your cinnamon stick and there you go. Next and last we're just going to make some fortified turkey stock. As you can see here I have a turkey pope's nose, which my butcher was kind enough to give me. To that, I'm going to add a quartered onion, some fresh thyme, parsley, and sage, and a chopped carrot and celery. Once that's got a little bit of color on it, we're going to add some turkey stock, taking care not to spill a drop. Perfect. Once you've covered the vegetables with turkey stock and cleaned up your cooktop, we're going to bring this to a simmer and cook for at least 45 minutes, making our boxed stock taste less like a box and more like stock. The next day, everything's cooled off and therefore has become leftovers, which we must now coax into ball form with, of course, some Andy's mints. First up, I forgot to make the gravy, so real quick, we want to put about half a cup of fat in a pan. I'm using butter and our reserved turkey drippings. And to that, we're going to add half a cup of all-purpose flour, whisking and cooking for one to three minutes until the raw flour smell dissipates, and then slowly adding in splashes of our stock, whisking to a state of smoothness after each addition. Oop, don't forget those turkey drippings. And this stuff came out pretty thick and pretty pale, so I'm going to darken it and flavor it both with soy sauce and a little bit of gravy master. I'm also going to season it with kosher salt, freshly ground pepper, and nutmeg. I know I'm kind of the nutmeg guy, but nutmeg and gravy really actually works. If you don't like it, fill out the rebate form, send me your gravy, and I will mail you a replacement in three to five weeks. Give it a taste for seasoning, and then since it's getting mashed into ball form, we need to cool it off. I'm spreading it out on a rim baking sheet, placing it in the fridge, and while it's cooling, I'm going to peel the skin off of and shred our dark turkey meat. Once it's shredded down to a nice form factor, we can start assembling. Now my first instinct was to sort of take a flap of stuffing, then place the turkey, gravy, cranberry sauce, green beans, pumpkin pie, and of course Andy's mint in the center. Then I imagine the stuffing wrapping around these fillings, keeping them safe as we turn this thing into a scotch egg, patting out some mashed potatoes into a disc and ensconcing the stuffing ball within it, creating an all-inclusive Thanksgiving snowball. But then a much more practical idea came to mind. Why not arrange all the fillings on a table and go full cold stone creamery on them, chopping and folding them together like common mix-ins on an admittedly not refrigerated table. Then grabbing a handful of the sort of grisly looking end product and much more easily shaping it into a ball that can then be wrapped in mashed potatoes of course. Now it seems like we have our bases pretty covered but I'm sorry to say that my ideas did not stop there. Yep, I am very sorry to say that this is happening. We are going to consciously make the decision to put every element of a Thanksgiving dinner in a food processor, stare unblinkingly into the void, and blend into a Thanksgiving paste. Let's all just silently reflect for a moment while we watch this liquefy. Do you see what you guys make me do? And now, obviously, I have to try it. Thanksgiving paste food product. Thanksgiving of the future. Come on, Andy, don't be a wimp. It's just normal food mashed together. Just eat it. And I gotta say, it's actually really, really good. I'm kidding. It's not good at all. It's like extra lumpy, grainy, Thanksgiving flavored mashed potatoes. That being said, we have to try to make something out of it. Can't just throw it away. I mean, when you look into the void, after all, 
it looks back. So next stage is to batter and deep fry these things. So I'm setting up a two stage battering system, combining one cup of cornstarch, quarter cup of flour, and a teaspoon of kosher salt in one vessel, and one and a half cups flour, and a teaspoon of baking powder in another, perhaps slightly larger vessel, to which we're gonna add three cups of light beer style lager, creating an ethereal beer batter that must be used immediately. That is after whisking to a consistency of about lumpy pancake batter. So first our balls are getting thoroughly coated in the cornstarch mixture, patting off any excess, then they're going for a bath in the wet stuff, and once completely coated, they're headed over to the stovetop where we have some 350 degree Fahrenheit oil ready to receive. It's very hard to not lose some batter in the process, so don't beat yourself up and fry for four to five minutes until deeply golden brown, and hopefully heated through. I'm starting with our gobstopper ball, then frying our cold stone creamery balls, no more than two at a time because they're basically giant ice cubes in the oil, then I'm frying our heart of darkness paste that I've rolled into little balls and coated with breadcrumbs, which I quickly discovered exploded, which is understandable, they are not of this realm. So I'm fortifying the paste with eggs and breadcrumbs and likewise battering before deep frying. I refuse to liquefy a Thanksgiving dinner for nothing, we are getting some balls out of it. Once those are golden brown and crisp, just like everybody else, we are draining on paper towels, and then finally, it's time to rack them up and taste test. First up, the little fritters of darkness, and they obviously look amazing inside, but how do they taste? And the answer is, not good, but not bad. Sort of like a cornless hush puppy that had a nightmare about Thanksgiving last night. Then the gobstopper, which is kind of cool, you can see every element, including the melty Andes mint, but it's a little unwieldy and the chocolate is too pronounced. The real winner here was the Cold Stone version. The chocolate was chopped in, so it wasn't overbearing. You can taste a little bit of Thanksgiving in every bite, plus it's deep fried. You might laugh, but it was the only one that I had to cut into pieces so that everybody could try it. All right, so we've made traditional American turkey stuffing many, many times on this show. If you wanna see how to make it, click the link in the upper right hand corner right now. So today we're gonna to take a crack at some different spins on stuffing. First up, the ever popular cornbread stuffing. I've got two packages of store-bought cornbread here that I'm preparing with a great deal of difficulty, cracking my eggs, gently whisking to combine, and that's how you make store-bought cornbread batter. Until next time, I'm Andrew Ray and this has been Base. I'm kidding. Now, instead of preparing according to package directions, we are greasing and parchment paper lining a large rimmed baking sheet, spreading out evenly, maybe giving a few heartfelt taps against the countertop to release any bubbles and into the oven it goes. 400 degrees Fahrenheit for 12 to 15 minutes or until browned and cooked through. Let it cool in the pan, and then we're going to invert it out. And as you can see, we have cornbread with much more surface area than normal cornbread. This will hopefully add a little crunch and prevent the cornbread from turning into mush. Go ahead and cut this into a grid of one inch squares. Go ahead and get back in there, little guy. And then as a further anti-mush measure, we are spreading these out on another rim baking sheet and then drying out the way we would for any other bread stuffing, either in a very low oven for a few hours or left out uncovered for a couple days to stale. Now, stuffing isn't the only stuff in stuffing. There's other stuff, usually some par-cooked meat, vegetables, and broth. For the cornbread, I'm gonna prepare what we would normally prepare for standard stuffing. Browning and crumbling one pound of sage sausage in a large cast iron skillet, scooping it out with a slotted spoon onto some paper towels to drain, and sauteing half a large chopped onion in the sausage fat. About three minutes or until well sweated, and then we're adding a couple chopped ribs of celery. About another three minutes, adding a large clove of chopped garlic in the last 30 seconds. Once the garlic is fragrant, we're gonna kill the heat and add a few tablespoons of chopped fresh sage. Let the stuff cool off just a little bit, and then in a large bowl, we are combining the dried cornbread cubes, sausage, vegetables, and and of course stock. You could use chicken or vegetable, but of course for the most classic Thanksgiving flavor, you wanna go turkey. In spite of the store-bought cornbread, you ideally wanna use homemade stock as this is gonna become one of the predominant flavors in your in your stuffing. Add the stock a little bit at a time, giving it a mix between additions, along with one large beaten egg for structure. We wanna get the cornbread saturated with stock to the point that it's almost falling apart, but still retaining its shape. Now, normally I am a staunch opponent of raisins and stuffing, but in cornbread, it kinda of makes sense. It's sweeter, it's a little cakier, and like many people, I prefer not to actually stuff my turkey with stuffing. It basically guarantees that you're gonna overcook the rest of your turkey by the time the stuffing comes up to a safe temperature. Plus, if you set aside a few dozen cornbread chunks, you can press them into the top, both to add a little crunch, a little visual flair, and to really drive home that this is cornbread. Wrap tightly in aluminum foil and bake at 375 for 25 minutes, removing the foil and baking for an additional 15 to get some nice brownage on the top. And there you have it, after you let it cool for like 10 minutes, you got cornbread stuffing that doesn't turn into a pile of cornbread paste. Just watch those moisture levels because it wants to, but you can't let it. The stuff is delicious, but as far as this episode, this is where tradition stops, because now we're venturing into the brave new world of stuffings we made up. First off, what is apparently my knee-jerk reaction whenever I need to put a spin on something? Italian-style stuffing. 
For this, we're using a small loaf of store-bought olive focaccia. Make sure not to use the oily gourmet stuff, otherwise you're going to get greasy stuffing. Now, instead of sausage, I thought a cool way to go might be fried pancetta and prosciutto. So I've got about half a pound of pancetta here that I'm browning and crisping, and then in the pancetta fat, I'm going to fry the prosciutto. The only reason I'm cooking this one is because I want to put as little fat as possible into the stuffing so we don't end up having to dab it with a napkin like a slice of pepperoni pizza. Once the roughly four ounces of chopped prosciutto are crisped up, we're continuing with the vegetables as before, just without the celery. That is the only difference. Oh, we're also doubling the garlic. Oh, and we're also adding two ounces of chopped sun-dried tomatoes and um, three ounces of chopped artichoke hearts. Oh, and, and an ounce of pine nuts, but that's it. We're sauteing these all together for about three minutes until, I don't know, cooked, dumping it over our air or oven dried focaccia cubes. I think I made way too much meat, so I'm only adding about half of what I prepared. The website's recipes will reflect as such, and then from there on out, it's actually the same procedure as the last stuffing. Greased cast iron baking vessel wrapped in aluminum foil, 350 for 25 minutes. Uncover and bake an additional 15 minutes, optionally grating some Parmigiano Reggiano over top before returning it to the womb, after which it will emerge golden brown, crisp, and ready to confuse and delight your Thanksgiving guests. This stuff tastes distinctly Italian, and it deliciously stands on its own, but it's going to play nice with whatever you mash it together with on your Thanksgiving plate. Next and last, I want to try something really and truly crazy. Biscuit stuffing. Yes, of course you could make your own biscuits, but I'm just using the biscuits out of the pop can, both because it's way easier and because homemade biscuits might commit the sin of being flaky, buttery, and tender, whereas these are more like biscuit-style products, which, once cooled completely, slices easily into stuffing appropriate cubes, which we're gonna give the same treatment as the rest. Meanwhile, for the meat, since we're already going kind of crazy with this one, let's use bacon. A lot of bacon. La Don so large. They require a splash of water to help the fat render out during the earlier parts of cooking, preventing them or their fat from burning by the time they get crisp. Let those drain on paper towels and saute our onion and celery in the reserved fat, killing the heat and finishing with one teaspoon each chopped rosemary and thyme, about half a teaspoon of freshly grated nutmeg, and a tablespoon of chopped fresh sage. Let those flavors just barely get to know each other, talking corporate Christmas party, and then likewise combine them in a large bowl with biscuit cubes and giant chunks of crispy bacon. Saturate with stock until just barely fully saturated, mixing between each addition, adding an egg after the first addition, etc, etc, and why not, 8 ounces of grated cheddar cheese. About as ridiculous and unhealthy a thing as I can possibly imagine, what better way to celebrate America? Dump and press into a well-buttered baking vessel, cover with aluminum foil, and then same procedure, 350 for 25 minutes, then uncover in 15 to 20 minutes more. And there you have it. Biscuit bacon cheddar stuffing, hubris in a bowl. Every bit as delicious and irresponsible and awesome and loaded with saturated fat as it sounds. So if you want to take a break from all the traditional Thanksgiving salads and fresh fruit, this could be a new bold direction to go in. It'd also make a really great breakfast casserole if you mixed a few more eggs in there. Now all we need to complete our Thanksgiving table is a turkey probably and a great cocktail. And I, and I think something hot and mulled will be just perfect. So I'm simmering 24 ounces of apple cider with a few cinnamon sticks and some freshly grated nutmeg for about 10 10 minutes. Then, fresh off the boil, we are straining it into a heat-proof container and adding 9 ounces of the Singleton Single Malt Scotch, giving it a spirited mix, and that's it. Serve in a glass mug with a cinnamon stick and some freshly grated nutmeg for garnish, and we got here is autumn in a glass.